Welcome to the Broken Pie Chart Podcast, episode 240. I'm your host, Derek Moore. With me once again is my semi-permanent co-host, CEO of Zega Financial, Jay Pestercelli. Jay, 240, even number, you're on. I mean, this is great. 200, probably congratulations on 240 podcasts, Derek. I know I always hit you on the on the milestones, but like, it's pretty impressive stuff, buddy. I, I, I know a lot of people appreciate that you put these together. I know I enjoy participating in them, so great job. Yes, thank you. And imagine you could, if you, if you were so inclined, and you, you've been on a lot of these, or especially last two years, you've been, I, I say, the semi-permanent co-host. But yeah, you could go and download all 240, and you could actually listen to me talk for 240 hours straight, and you as well. So, It's my favorite yeah. thing. I'm doing it. I'm starting it right after we're done. I think that's a good idea. By the way, for the audience, I just want to mention something. I, I you know, podcast stats are a little bit, um, they're not super, super reliable yet. But one of the things I found out is there are a lot of people who are listening just on a browser. And I would recommend people, if you're using an iPhone, you can use the native, the uh, podcast app. You can go to the upper, uh, search for Broken Pie Chart. You can subscribe in the upper right-hand corner. And then anytime a new episode is out, you can just go to your app. Same thing with uh, Google Podcast. And there are other podcast apps as well. If you're using a Microsoft Windows phone, what's wrong with you? Go go to the store today and get, you, know, you don't need it anymore. <laughs> so I, I'd encourage people to do that. And also, I never asked for this, Jay, but apparently Apple Podcasts, the rankings, they like to see reviews. And so if you want to give us five-star review and say something nice, uh, go to your podcast app and do that. Uh, if you don't have a five-star review, don't bother. Please, please don't submit anything. But anyway, <laughs> you know, Derek, it's, it's not uncommon, right? I, you go to restaurants all the time or you go to a hotel. It's, it's not uncommon for someone to say, if you've enjoyed yourself, leave a five-star review. Yeah. That's, I don't think that's, that's bad of you to ask. I know we're not pushy about it. Well, no, but it's, you know, you, you listen to other podcasts and, and I've never taken advertisers, don't have any plans to. I think it sort of, you know, breaks up the show and I don't like it. And a lot of shows, they just start and they do five minutes of, Here's everything you can do for us. So do do us a favor. Uh, that's that's how you can help us also with the rankings. You know, go in the podcast app, leave a five star review, and and share it with someone. Share it with multiple people. So with that, Jay, let's get into. We've got lot lots to talk about this week, and unlike the U.S. government, which is shutting down, we are still working. Uh, let me set this up, and then we should discuss this. The U.S. government is basically. It looks like over the weekend there's going to be a shutdown. This this isn't a debt ceiling thing. This is you've got to pass bills and to to fund the government so it the government can be open. And the two sides can't really agree on that. It's not the first time there's been a a, a government shutdown. The last one is in 2018. But what that means is non-essential workers will not go to work. Uh, they don't get paid, but then when they go back to work, they get all their back pay back. So it's in some ways kind of a vacation. And I have a story about that one time I was in DC. But from the market perspective, Jay, I don't know historically. I think it's more of the, what do we call it? The sell the rumor, buy the fact, sell the rumor, buy the, buy the what is it? Sell the news, buy the what am I saying here, Jay? What is this? Help yeah, me you're saying you know you, you you buy the rumor, sell the news is the traditional uh, uh, the traditional phrase, right? Because if you think of some news is coming out about a stock, you buy it, you buy it on the rumor, and then as soon as the news comes out, you dump it, right? Because that's all the pop that you're going to get. That's I think this is the opposite, right? Where we 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 sold on the rumor, right? Like the market's been dropping. I think it probably. It, it pushed it down a little bit today. That's that's my guess. It looked like, um, you know, as there was no uh, resolution throughout the day, the market just continued to drop. By the way, we're recording this on Friday. I'm talking about Friday, the last day of September 29th. I, by the way, kind of glad September's over, right? Like, not the most fun. But usually, it's usually not a fun month in the market. But, of course, it's the end of the quarter. And the market basically closed on the lows for the quarter. That's awesome. That's not awesome. But it's anyway, happy to have September over. So we're recording this. And so just throughout the day, it seemed like the market was kind of ticking lower, lower, lower. 
uh, you know, as, as, as news, uh, you know, came out. So I just, I, yeah. So it sold the rumor. It didn't yet bounce on the news. Maybe it's going to be over. So where were you going with this about market performance? Well, you might be surprised that, you know, everyone seems like, oh, I don't know what's going to happen if the market shuts down. Oh my, the market or the government's going to shut down. Won't the market crash? Well, not so fast. The historicals on that, and apparently this is from the Congressional Research Service. Uh, I'm sure those are fine folks, but uh, anyway, they, uh, they put together a little thing. They're probably not working next week. <laughs> Sorry, go ahead. Not if, uh, uh, you know, not if, you know, the, anyway. So during the shutdown, three months later and six months later, the, the performance of the S&P 500, so S&P uh, 500 returns around government shutdowns, the average is 0%. During a shutdown, okay, not, that's not too crazy. Three months later- so No change in the market during the shutdown, that's the average? Okay. That's the average and percent of time positive, 50%. So you got a 50-50 proposition, but on average it's zero. 2.6% three months later, 60% of the time the market's up and 7.5% uh, six months later and 70% of the time the market's up. Now to throw a little at you here, the longest ever shutdown, or at least longest ever, according to this goes all the way back to 1976. I don't know if there were shutdowns prior to then. Uh, December 21st, 2018 to January 25th, 2019, 35 days. During that time, the market was up 10% during the shutdown, 11%, 14% respectively, three months, six months after. Uh, 2018, although the, the 2019, 2018, 2019, it's 35 days. But that was a partial shutdown because some stuff was open and they funded some things with continuing resolutions and piecemeals. The three days, the government was shut down 2018. Uh, Mark was up 1% during it, minus 5 after and 0%. And you go back to this. I don't know, Jay. I'm not going to read all these off. Uh, but to me, this is people who are going on TV and making a big deal about this for the markets maybe they haven't looked at the averages here, Jay. So what, like, what's the worst? All right, so let's just jump to the numbers. Like, what's the worst the market has been down, uh, would you say, three months later? Like, what's, what's, let's, what's that number look like? So out of all these government shutdowns, you said back to 76, what's the most it's been down? Well, dur during the shutdown, minus 4%, that was September of 1979 to end of September, October, if I look at, let's see, the worst, there was a minus 5%, 1983, six months later. Um, yeah, that's that's it. Those are the worst. Minus 8%, 1981. All right. So we got a minus 8 is the worst that we've had three months Three months, after. Three months later. Yeah. The worst is yeah, minus I mean, a lot six probably months later. happened yeah. in, the, in the, anyway. So like, I just, I think you're right to bring up that it's not really a market mover. Right. I mean, I mean, I think that's what you're saying. Like, this is not a catastrophe. Right. This is not the the end of uh, uh, of 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 the, the the bull bounce that we've had since the bottom of 22, as we know it. Right. I mean, it could be. But historically speaking, this hasn't been a, a, a catalyst for for panic. I would say, too. I mean, I look at 1970, 1979. What was happening then? Hmm. Oh, yeah. Inflation rates going up, rates going up a lot. So I think it's a coincidental thing that just happens to align sometimes with, uh, with what else is going on. I, I don't think this is this is a big driver. Like, yeah, I mean, I think I think we we were talking earlier in the day. I think it's one piece of you know many that is causing a little uh, anxiety and fear in the market right now. But yeah, uh, in and of you know in isolation uh, in a bubble, you're right. This doesn't seem to be you know to be that big of a, that big of a deal from a market moving perspective. 2013, I'll tell you my quick little DC story. I'm sure. Yeah. I was going to say, I'm sure the people waiting for their passports to get done are, it's a big deal, but uh, others, maybe not so much. Go ahead. Sorry. Actually on that note, uh, I have global entry, you know, the thing that it's like uh, TSA pre-check, but global entry includes TSA pre-check. But if you come back to the country, you put your fingers on the machine and, you, you sail through the line. You skip, you go around the, 
the other side. Yeah. Yeah. All it is is a renewal. So I renewed and they're saying it could be a year to review my renewal. Nothing's changed. Just a renewal. I don't know what's going on over there. But uh, anyway, so my DC story and shutdowns, this must have been 2013. I, I kind of forget. I was probably in DC for some speaking event. And I remember it was, you know, you, you sort of, um, it was at night. And so, you know, during the day I was doing work, but I, I went somewhere for lunch by the White House. And there's all these people, like, it was like a Friday happy hour, you know? And I said to one of, one of the people there, so what's going on here? Are these like tourists? They said, no, the government shut down. All these people are furloughed and they're just hanging out all day because they're not getting paid. But as soon as they go back, they get the back pay. So this is like a free vacation. That was the, the boots on the ground report from, from 2013, Jay, when the government was shut down about 17 days. So there you go. That's my DC story. It's interesting. Like that's where they decided. Like, hey, I'm going to go stand outside of my work instead of now that I don't have to go to work. I mean, could they be called in in the middle of the? No, no, they were they were inside bars and restaurants. Oh, <laughs> oh, 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 I thought they're just hanging out on the street. I miss. No, they're on vacation. You know, they're like all oh, I don't have to go to work. Don't have to do anything. I'm just going uh, out all kids day. Kids are in so. school, and I'm going to stand in a bar. Great, awesome. Well, who knows if they have kids or not? I mean, I, I didn't go and interview these people. This is a boots on the ground report, Jay. This is this is an investigative reporting. So, um, all right. By the way, you mentioned. I think we're done on the government shutdown, right? The the only thing I'll mention is so there is some data with regard to GDP, and during the most recent shutdown, which is the one in I think it was whatever the recent one was, the Congressional Budget Office estimated that roughly 0.4% was shaved off quarterly GDP over the five-week period. And other estimates based on the experience from last decade point to a potential loss of 0.1 to 0.2% from quarterly GDP growth for each week of closures. So there apparently it could be a, a reduction in GDP because government spending is one of those inputs and if government can't spend, you would think they would just make it up on the back end. And then the other thing I'll, I'll just say is when you look at 2013 and 2018, which were uh, 35 days and 16 days respectively, it seem, it's sort of a mixed picture. 2013, the market sold off right before, but not much, uh, and then just rallied right after the start of the shutdown. And then 2018, the market was already falling into it. And then rallied after the shutdown. So I, I, I'm not. I can't tell anybody what to do. You know, you do what you want to do. But to me, there's there's nothing here. Well, I mean, I I, I was going to make that argument, right? And this the the data from 2018 that well, the market was going down into the shutdown. So once the shutdown happens, the market's already discounted, and that was the case of 2018. And it's certainly the case right now, right? What are we? What are we off the highs? Are we eight percent? I'm just. Sorry, quick calculator here. So what are we close today? 4288. I'll stall here. Right by. The buttons. Just, thank you very the much. Yes. Uh, yeah, I mean, we're down like 7 right? 7%, just under 7%. So maybe, you know, you could argue that was the lead into it. But even so, when you take a look at both of the those most, you know, two most prolonged shutdowns, seem uh, you can make an argument with a, with a – Two data points, it's uh, it's not bearish at all. It could be bullish because it already gets pre-baked. So maybe it goes back to your uh, first statement, which was sell the rumor and buy the news. This is more about rates. And Jamie Dimon recently uh, said something about the worst case would be 7% interest rates with stagflation. If they're going to have to lower volumes and higher rates, maybe raise rates, there will be stress in the system. And I think his point, I'm looking for the quote here. Yeah, the U.S. is not prepared for 7% rates. So I didn't catch the whole, you know, I think he was at either an event or he was in an interview. But I think he's making the point that, you know, I don't know that everyone's really discounting the fact or, or building in in their models that we could have higher rates. Meaning if the back end of the yield curve reflates, and we stick here on the front end, you know, five, five and a half percent. Usually there's a time premium 
for fives and tens and and twenties and thirties. So I don't know, Jay, I mean, seems like this is rate driven because there's high correlation between the bond market rates go up, bonds go down. Stock market has been going down, as you pointed to, and the dollar has been going up. All these things are correlated right now. This is about rates. Yeah, I, I agree. The sell-off uh, seems to be you know tied to the the, the rise in rates. Uh, I I don't think he's wrong. I don't think people the 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 the, the market's prepared for a seven percent. Uh, you know, for seven percent interest rates. You, do you think he was talking about the ten year, the Fed funds rate, the thirty year? Like, what do you think he was talking about? Because I I saw some of that interview and he wasn't specific. Um, I don't know if I've seen that specificity in it. And I, I am well. Look, I mean that that would definitely be you know constrictive, and and I think that would definitely impact a lot of folks. I mean, we we've talked about what. The, the the rising rates have done to the economy and what, what sectors it's affected, right? We talk about housing, uh, we talk about loans, uh, we talk about, you know, the, 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 the ripple effect into the discretionary spend. Um, I don't necessarily know if it really, uh, uh, of course, then the dollar, right, which affects markets. But when you think about the economy, I don't know how much it really affected everything else this time around. The consumer still seems to be pretty strong. Unemployment has yet to rear its head, ugly head. So that seems to be okay. I, you know, I, I don't in Florida where I am. I'm starting to see some, you know, cracks in the economy. Our economy is pretty strong down here, but you know, there's for rent signs in front of most uh, commercial buildings. Some places are shutting down. I think a seven percent. Uh, interest rates would make it very difficult for people to start new business or even to afford new business loans. So I think a lot of that stuff gets kind of held off. I think it's also harder for uh, people that are using their credit cards to kind of fund themselves in, you know, in business can also start to become a little harder. So it could, I think it could slow things down. I think it's bad for, of course, like anybody, it's bad for the consumer that's living on their Living on credit cards, I think that's bad, period, but it gets just even worse, right? If they're out there waiting for rates to drop and uh, to kind of get a little relief, it doesn't feel like that's happening anytime soon. And are they the number one or number two credit card provider? I mean, I think Bank of America is number one, right? But they're up there. Uh, I can't remember who's the biggest. But I think they got a lot of insight into consumer behavior, and uh, I don't think he's wrong. I think 7% rates, the economy is not prepared for that. You do wonder at a 7% rate, and I always go back to, to when rates go up more than anybody thinks is possible, that's when you start to see stuff. Uh, Orange County was one of those things. You remember that when Orange County essentially went bankrupt, they, they were short the, the near end of the, the yield curve and long the, the far end of the curve when rates on the near term went up because they were using those to fund the, uh, the long term, uh, their investments ran into problems. It's you know, people tell me it's in textbooks now. I remember it because I was in the markets during that time, but it's it's a case. You know, Julie Coronado was on, she was a guest on the Odd Lots Bloomberg podcast and she's a, a macro policy person. Now I did fall asleep halfway through this and it's not to say that Julie wasn't interesting. I was just tired when I'm, so I don't really know the full link, but her, her main thesis was, you know, a lot of people say, well, the, the economy's really handled higher rates or is it it hasn't really had to handle the full impacts yet. And her point was, there's some lags that are going on and maybe the lag effects are going to hit a little bit harder. I don't know, Jay. Uh, well, um, so so let's talk about the scenario that gets you to 7% rates, right? Is it the Fed moving or the longer end of the curve rising higher, right? Fed staying at their five and a quarter to five and a half rate, and then the market kind of catches up, or you think they have to raise to get to that point? I, th- I don't think they have any intention of raising the seven. Doesn't seem like it, but so what's oil what's the going scenario to- that tr- drives rates up to well, seven? It's oil. Well, oil. All right, so let's say oil goes up and the CPI reflates. Let's say the CPI, you know, starts to move again, which could happen. Who knows? I don't know what's going to happen, but. That's a scenario in, in your first thing. Okay, the Fed has to go higher. And then since Jamie Dimon didn't say which rates were going into seven, I don't know. 
I think it's unlikely. It seems unlikely, but Jay, I mean, going from three to remember we were at three percent. We said, yeah, it's probably only going to go maybe to three, three and a half, and then it goes to goes to you know five and a half or five and a quarter, uh, or it just reflates. The back end reflates. You have the bear steepening. I think I think you're right. I think you, that's it, right? Where um, well, I was going to go down the inflation side, where the consumer doesn't slow down. People don't, you know, the economy doesn't slow down, and people don't lose jobs, and uh, we continue to see, you know, people willing to spend. And uh, you know, I'm not sure how we should we should probably look, Derek, at like what um, you know savings rates look like versus debt. I know we've talked about that in the past, but I mean that if that doesn't switch to be more constrictive, you could see the Fed being forced to continue to raise rates. I think Kashkari was out, Neil Kashkari, the uh, uh, Fed governor from Minnesota, I believe, was out saying like he actually thinks they're going to have to raise rates again. The, the futures don't point to that right now, but um, you know he's out there talking tough, talking hawkish, which has been one of the tools the Fed has used. Uh, you know, I do think that if they don't see a slowing, they're going to feel the need to to raise rates higher and to to really try to get their arms around inflation, or at least they think they will. Again, I don't think you and I have felt. They've had a huge impact on the change of inflation uh, lately, but you know maybe it's something along those lines, right? Where they feel like, hey, the headline number's too high. Uh, things like oil are pushing prices higher. People are still spending. Maybe they raise rates, but to get to seven seems, yeah, I don't know. Uh, maybe and so I think that's one way. And then I think what you were talking about is that the way the yield curve uninverts, right? is if the Fed funds are five and a quarter to five and a half, that means the longer duration has to be higher. And then maybe that's what happens, right? Maybe you start to see a two year at six, uh, you know, 10 year at six and a half and a 30 at seven. I mean, maybe that's the way the curve goes. It's, you should have a a term premium. You should have a time or term premium, whatever you want to call it. I mean, if you're going to hold government paper for 30 years, you ought to get more money than you can get it on a one year. That's normally how it goes. Sure, it's because it's riskier, right? It's, yeah, yeah. You have more risk, but you're not you're not being paid. You know, look look at um, look at the thirty year bond. Look at TLT. I mean, we, we talked about that last week. It was that's a, a train wreck. I mean, TLT is off more than fifty percent from its high. <laughs> yeah. So right. Let me, let me give you a couple other things too with the economy. And, you know, I, I watch advanced real retail and food services sales. It's, uh, you can find it on, if you Google Fred, F-R-E-D, it's a St. Louis uh, Federal Reserve Bank. They have a, a bunch of free charts and they got a ton of stuff there. The high in, in the high watermark for advanced uh, real retail sales was April of 2022. We have not exceeded that. In fact, we're, we're you know, we're sort of down to flat. And that's one of the things that normally starts to break before recessions. I'm not saying we're going to have a recession, but there are things that are not great. There are things that normally would be more of a problem and apparently, you know, they haven't been so far. So I don't know, Jay. I mean, and then, you know, we talked about the econ PI where half the stuff is in the contraction quad, half the stuff is in the, you know, what is it? The expansion quad It's a mixed picture, but yeah, I mean, to kind of tie the, the knot on this 7% yields, the market has not, it's been bumpy having a 30 year go to 4.68. It'd be awfully bumpy in, in the short term, I think going to the 7%. Why, by the way, and people will listen to this. And by the way, Jay and I are not saying, Hey, you should sell everything. And you know, we like to to talk about the markets and this is why we hedge, because so often when people are going on TV and saying there's going to be a crash or this is going to be a problem, it you know you, you miss out. And so, this is the good thing about a hedged equity strategy, Jay. Yeah, and it it, it prevents us from having a you know time when we want to get in and out. Like if you want to manage risk uh, for your client, which you, your clients you and I both do. Um, it's, it's, it's not something that a headline forces us to make a decision. We're already, you know, we have defined our risk and protected it. And so, yeah, that's, that is why we hedge Derek, right. And why we constantly rehedge, right. There's many of our strategies are all about protection and reducing the volatility in your portfolio. 
um, which, you know, uh, volatility, as I say in one of the chapters of my book, Buy and Hedge, The Five Iron Rules for Investing. Oh, nice plug. Where can they get that, John? Uh, where is that available? I think you can get it on Amazon right at the same place where you can get uh, the broken pie chart, Derek, your book. I think they're a great That's a good, yeah. Uh, anyway, yeah. Well, I'm not sure anybody's ever bought our book after uh, after the podcast, but there's there's another way people could support you. I'm not pushing on that one. Uh, anyway, in the book, we talk about how volatility is kryptonite for your portfolio. You want to reduce that, right? You want to kind of reduce the big downswings because it's, uh, it's easier to get back from them when you've reduced them. Uh, just the whole, to recover from a 10%, all you need is 11% compared to, when you lose 25%, you need a 33% recovery. So because we hedge, we don't have to worry so much about changing our posture and changing our bias in the portfolios. You could stick to the plan. You're not forced to kind of run for cover. So I, you know, I don't know what's going to happen either, Derek. I, I will tell you, I think I probably got a little more bearish over the last two weeks. And like all people, I'm a I'm 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 open to the uh you know, the suggestions of the daily newscasts and the market, when I see them down, I go, oh, maybe things aren't so good, right? And I start to notice things like, oh, a lot of for, a lot of for sale signs or for a lot of uh, rent, uh, for rent signs at commercial buildings. I don't know. It just feels like things got a little slippery, uh, a little more to the downside, not to mention, I think, you know, some of the work that you and I do when it comes to our volatility triggers and what we're watching in the, in the options market, how we see that there's a little bit of a bearish bias to it right now. So, yeah, I think we've probably become a little bearish, but haven't changed anybody's allocations, right? Everything is hedged already, so all good there. You you haven't changed anybody's allocation, right, Derek, because of the the wiggle we're having in the market right now? No, I mean, the idea is if, if you're hedged, you don't have to try and, you know, be too tricky or too calculated on, you know, oh, do I want to get in or out? It's just, you know, you sort of have hedges there. And I will tell you, and I've said this before, most of the uh, the individual wealth clients that I work with, most of them, I would say almost all of them want the markets to go up because even though they have, let's say, hedges or buffers on, it's, you know, normally you do better when the market's going up. So, but every once in a while, I have someone who absolutely wants the market to crash. Because their theory is, you know, let's say we're hedged at about a 10% lower level and the market goes down 50%. Well, they've avoided that 40% or their their hedges have made profits on that, you know, 10 to, to 50%, which is the 40%. And then you sort of re-enter the market with hedging profits or avoided losses at lower level. I don't know how it is with you, Jay, but it's, it's you know, most people want the market to go up. But I have a few people who said, you know, kind of want the market to to really get hit. Yeah, when you're you're he- you're right. When you're hedged, there's a little bit of like this perverse, you know, incentive for like, all right, now I got the insurance, let's let's let it go and I want to come in and I could buy the market cheaper with dollars that I haven't lost uh and then have more on the way up than I had on the way down. But eventually those people still want to be opportunistic and profit on the upside, right? So if they've avoided the loss because they're hedged, um you're right. It's you know, I, I, it's it's akin to, you know, you have insurance, you never really want to use your insurance, but you're glad you had it when it happened, and that insurance can pay you. And in the market, it could yield profits that could then be reallocated and you buy the market at a discount, but a discount you did not experience. So yes, there is that little kind of, I, I mean, it's not perverse. I mean, you know, look, you paid the money to be hedged. Uh, you, every once in a while, it's going to pay off. And typically, the way we hedge, right? 20, 30 Delta options, and I won't go into too much, but just the probability of those things, you know, paying off is a 20 to 30%, right? So two, uh, 20, 30%, that's one out of five, one out of four, one out of three years, those hedges are going to pay you and you, you got to use it. Like, um, you have the insurance, you should use it, right? I mean, that's the idea here. You paid for it, you got to cash in on it. And so that is the benefit of having it is you can then put it to work. You don't always use your insurance, right? You think about your insurance premium that you pay uh, just on anything, whether it's health, car, home, uh, you're not always using it. And it's money that you spent and you go, well, I kind of needed to be insured. Same thing with the market. You pay it. You don't need it every year. But then every once in a while, when you do need it, every one out of five, one out of four years, it ends up paying for itself and then some. So, 
Yeah, I mean, that's that is uh, an interesting perspective. But again, most clients still prefer to see their balances go up because when you're hedged, that doesn't mean you're not going to make money on the way up. You're still going to make money on the way up. You just had a cost of hedging built into the overall returns. You know, one of, one of the misnomers, uh, you mentioned premium and it, it made me think about covered calls. And I think one of the, is it misnomer? Is that the word? You know, when, Misconception? When you sell covered calls, yeah, I don't know what. I'll figure it out later. But, you know, it's... it's uh, you kind of you sell covered calls, and a lot of people think that's hedging. That's not necessarily hedging. That's a different strategy, and that's where you you've got let's say an underlying asset, you own it, and you're selling a call maybe a little bit above the market. You take in a premium. You still got the risk to zero. So you know, let's say X Y Z. Imagine this, Jay. We're going to talk about X Y Z again, but uh, my favorite fake stock. Imagine X Y Z is trading at a hundred. And you sell the 101 call and you sell it for a buck. I'm making this up as we go along. You should get more than a buck for that, but okay. You could be a better trader than that. I'm kidding. Go ahead. Go ahead. I'm doing easy math. I know we're going to get more. $2.78. Wonderful. 378. All right. So a dollar, you get a dollar, right? So if you own a 100 shares of XYZ and it goes to zero, so you have all the risk to zero. How often do stocks go to zero? Uh, most stocks do not go to zero, uh, unless maybe and, or somebody would joke around and say, except the ones that I own. Yeah, right? I've, I've some, had a few. Would say I've had a few in my time. Yeah, I've, I've enjoyed that. So, experience. so what's the risk? You buy a stock, a hundred shares, it goes to zero. You lose a hundred points, and let's say you have a hundred shares, so it's a hundred times hundred. That's that's your that's what you can lose. If you sell that covered call for a dollar, if you want to use a real number, Jay, that complicates the math, but you know, at a dollar, it's uh, really your risk is 100 minus the one. So it's really 99 to, to zero. That's the risk of a covered call. So covered calls really aren't a hedging strategy, but covered calls, you know, and we, we sell options, Jay, for income. Uh, we have different strategies that do that. There's definitely strategies where people are owning an asset and then selling covered calls to generate additional income. And, you know, one of the interesting things to me, Jay, is there's sort of this misunderstanding about, you know, everyone understands covered calls for the most part, you know, people who are engaged in the markets and, and have traded options. But when you turn it on its head, Jay, and I'll let you talk about this, and, you know, let's say we sell a put above the market, it's all of a sudden it's like something from outer space. So why don't you do my, use? you can use my comparison. You can use another one if you want. You don't like my dollar that I sold, but maybe counter it. Yeah. Compare and contrast. You it. got it. So, so yeah, the thing that I think that you're getting to is that a covered call, let's talk about the characteristics of a covered call. You have all the downside, as you just said, because your stock can go all the way to zero and you get this little bit of premium in your example, you get a dollar. Um, it, what you didn't mention about a covered call, but I think everybody understands this is that you're capped at where you, the strike where you sold that, uh, covered call, right? So in your example, did you sell the one one while it was XYZ was trading at a hundred? Is that, that was your example, I think. Exactly. So pretty around the money. Around, yeah. yeah. So, so, so if you have a covered call scenario and the mark and XYZ goes from 100 to 102, you're going to see why I picked that number in a minute. You have kind of maxed out the upside gain you have. That means you've earned from 100 to 101 where your strike was. So that is just straight up market appreciation uh, of the out of the money call. And then you have that premium that you earned of a dollar. So when you sell that call, you know, usually the math you should do in your head is, okay, this works best. If the market goes right to 102, that's my break even. If it goes to 103, nah, I shouldn't have sold the call. I gave up a dollar to the upside. But you still make the $2. You make the appreciation of the stock from 100 to 101. And you keep the premium that you sold that call for, which is a dollar. So that I think everybody gets that. And the reason why I went through those the details, because there's pieces within that that I now want to uh, – show the similarities between that and an in the money put. So what does it mean when what does it mean when you sell a put, right? When you sell a put, it means that you are willing to have the 
the XYZ stock put to you at the strike price, right? It means that's the opposite of when you buy a put, right? When you buy XYZ, uh, an XYZ put, you can put the stock to somebody at the strike. Well, if you're on the other side of that put, if you're the seller of that put, you now have said, okay, I'm willing to own this stock, XYZ, at 101 in our example, which means uh, if you're willing to buy it at 101 and the stock drops, you are going to buy the stock at 101 and you'll lose the difference between the 101 and the price that the stock is. So if the stock is trading at 50 and it gets put to you at 101, you once that happens, you've immediately lost $51 between the strike of 101 and the strike of and the price of 50. So that is what it means to be short a put. You have stock risk. You don't have leverage risk. You don't have unlimited risk. You have the risk of your strike price down to zero. Now, in that scenario that you just talked about, Derek, you should be able to sell that put for about $2. Now, why do I say $2? Well, the $2 strike, the $2 price that I sell that put has two components to it. The first is, hey, uh, the stock is trading at 100 and I just sold the 101. I have intrinsic value. I have this value of in the money, right? There's there's that put already has a dollar worth of value, right? XYZ trading at 100 and you sold the 101. You have at least a dollar of intrinsic value. The second component is the time value. It's the same time value of the short call that you sold in the covered call example. So you're going to both you're going to get $2 in total for selling the 101 strike put. And the two components are the in the money amount of a dollar and the time value of that option, which we're saying is also a dollar, because it's going to match the time value of the call. They're always fairly equal, the time value of the call and the put at the same strike. So whew, so now you've got this short put that you sold for $2. Well, what's the most you could make in this scenario? The most you can make is that $2 that you sold the put for. And that means your put has to expire worthless. Your put can go to zero. Well, at what strike price does your put go to zero? It's any, sorry, what stock price? Anything above 101, which is your strike price, that put expires to zero because now that put has no value at expiration. So your max gain occurs in that position. You make your max gain. You keep all $2 that you sold the put for at 101. Just like with the covered call where you maxed out your gain at 101. So exact same upside gain. And then we also talked about the risk, the same risk. You have all the downside exposure of the stock of XYZ, just like a covered call, minus that dollar premium you brought in. So all of this is to explain how an in-the-money put is the same thing as an out-of-the-money covered call. And in our example here, the $100 stock of XYZ with a 101 strike, selling the call and owning the stock is the same thing as just selling the 101 put, which is a dollar in the money. Whew, that was a long explanation, Derek. I should have had a whiteboard. Well, you know, we should have had something. <laughs> I will say, too, that I said XYZ is a stock, and it's usually easier for people to understand the stock. I could have said XYZ was a broad-based index. And then there's no, on cash settled, uh, broad-based indexes, which are European style, which means they only settle at expiration and index options, they settle for cash. Unlike American style options, which most are, are all, you know, equities are, that you could be assigned or called away. Index options are just cash settled. So, Jay, in your example, let's say XYZ was the XYZ broad index of whatever. Yeah. And it's cash settled. So, really, on expiration day, you just either sort of settle for cash and that's it, or and it, or you sort of owe money or, or take money, right? Yeah. Actually, in that example, like let's say the XYZ index was above my 101 strike price. That put still expires worthless, right? You keep the $2 that you sold it for. Great. Max gain, anything above 101, which is the strike price. Remember, it started at 100. If it closes above 101, awesome. My put expires worthless. But if, but the way that cash settled options work is it's the difference between the strike price, 101, 
and the price of the index. So if our XYZ index ended at $95, let's say, uh, you don't, right, you don't get the stock, there's no stock to be put to you, it's just a cash settled index. So essentially, you have to come up with $6, the difference between 95 and uh, 101, which incidentally is what you would lose if that was, uh, so you got two bucks, but you have to settle at six, your net difference is $4, right? Um, the That incidentally is the exact same thing was, would happen if you had a covered call where you were long at 100 and it went dead and you sold the 101 for a dollar and the stock went down five bucks, but you made one dollar, you also would lose four dollars. So this cash settled is just a really simple way uh, to kind of rectify or, or uh, expire out that option. And you don't have to worry about things like, oh, I got a signed Friday expiration and I hope nothing happens on Sunday because I know I'm going to get put to stock and the stock may tank. The beauty of the cash settled uh, options is that it, the math is done at the close on its expiration, right? So if you expire on, say, let's say you're using a daily uh, daily expiring option that settles to cash on a Wednesday, Wednesday at four o'clock, you know exactly the difference of cash between your strike price and the index. And you know if you max gained because you'd know it was out of the money or you know how much you lost, it's the difference between uh, the strike and the index minus what you brought in with the original premium. So it is a more simple way to trade options. You know, it, it almost, because it's so simple, but nobody talks about it. People go, wait a minute, when do I get put the stock? There's no stock to be put. You just get the difference in price, which, you know, let's face it is what trading really is anyway. I want to add something to you that, and I, and I left this part out. Uh, you made the comment that you got to come up with money if the stock's down, but actually this is a scenario where, in a covered call, you own the stock and you sell a call above it. And it's covered because it, with the case of stocks, you can deliver those shares if they get called away. With the case of an index, it's just, as Jay mentioned, it's the, the cash settled. But cash secured puts mean instead of stock in the account, you have cash. You don't have to come up with anything. It's in your account. And the cash secures all of that, You know, just like you do have the stock. You have cash in the account. And these days, a lot of times you can hold treasuries and treasuries are, you know, really short term treasuries right now are pushing 5.4, 5.5%. So it gets a little more complicated. We'll set that aside for now. But yeah, I mean, this cash secured put just means you have the cash for basically your entire risk, which is to zero. So on a hundred dollar stock, my, you know, if you bring in a buck, uh, you pretty much have to have uh, ninety nine dollars times times a hundred. That's what you have to have in your account. It's cash secured, much like you have a hundred shares of stock. I hope I didn't confuse things, but I thought I'd mention that. No, like I, th I think it's it's good to know, right? Because those um, cash secured puts are they're they're collateralized with cash, and like you said, or treasuries uh, these days, right? Those are both vehicles that allow you to kind of. Uh, uh, use because the most you can lose again, it's already defined, right? The most you can lose, and so if you have that amount of money sitting your in your account, your broker is going to say, "Fine, you could sell the put. You are a hundred percent collateralized, right?" And so, it, I, I, it actually, the <laughs> in this environment, Eric, right? What is the, uh, you know, if you're long stock, to you like, let's just say you're long the S P five hundred, you can earn a dividend by holding the stocks of the S P five hundred. Like, what's the the yield on the S P these days? Yeah, you know, I haven't looked today, but I'm going to guess around 1.4 percent, somewhere around. So there. if I'm long the, all the stocks of the S&P 500 and I do this covered call thing, I get my call premium, and hey, I'm on long, long stock, and there's a little dividend kicker of you know 1.4, 1.5 percent a year. Um, with the cash covered put, if if you could secure it with a five percent treasury, you're actually starting from a little better perspective, right? Like you're 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 earning this five percent, uh, which is you know, higher than the dividend of the S and P. So it's a little interesting dynamic that the cash cover put has uh, these days. The construction of it, if you're going to collateralize it with treasuries, how does has a little advantage on the return anyway, right? It is, it is, and as and as you you explained and I explained, it's sort of from a there there is a ceiling on both. And there is a floor in both. The floor is zero minus any premium received. And the ceiling is 
you can go up to the strike price. So, all right. I think I'm glad we went through that because we've, we've had some questions on that recently. Yeah, just, I, you know, not enough folks, not enough folks understand the in the money put concept. I think people um, have run a strategy in the past. I, we've heard it referred to as the wheel where you're selling out of the money, out of the money puts. That means below the current uh, price of the, uh, of the, the asset you're selling it on it's waiting to be assigned, right? So like, let's say you want to buy XYZ stock at 90, right? And you could sell that put for say 50 cents. And you're like, Hey, if it gets down to 90, I'm willing to buy it. But while I'm waiting, I'll earn this 50 cents. That's the way I think a lot of folks have learned about how short puts work, but, uh, not as many folks that at least that I've talked to understand the, in the money put concept, how it's, Hey, by the way, in that example, you're still taking stock risk. Like you can, if you get assigned, you can lose from 90 down to zero, right? It just means you bought at 90 instead of the other example where we're talking about 101. But um, the upside, you can't really gain much to the upside when you sell an out of the money put, right, Derek? Whereas an in the money put, you can you can earn the appreciation from the price of the stock XYZ or the index XYZ up to the strike price. Because guess what? You, it's already in the premium that you sold. You have it. It can go from, in my example, the 101 that we sold for uh, $2. You A dollar of it you can earn just because the underlying index moves up a dollar. Whereas if you're selling out of the money puts, you earn none of the upside. It's only time value that you earn. So I think you know there's an added dimension to the in the money put that I just don't think enough folks recognize um, as a really... I mean, I dare I say it, a much more elegant solution to the covered call tactic. And these days you even make a little more, unless your stock pays you more than 5% that the treasuries are paying. Uh, you know, it could be a you know alternative. So if you like covered calls, you should like maybe love in the money puts. Oh, that could be your recommendation this week. Yeah. Actually, it's not a recommendation. We're kidding. We're kidding. Compliance, no recommendations. <laughs> it's the same thing. Yeah. No, no, it is, same strategy. It is. Our point of doing this was just to sometimes with options, it's all about payoff structures and the PL graphs. And when you look at these two side by side, you're like, it's sort of the same thing. It really is. What's missing is what you described is the dividend of the underlying as opposed to the the interest quasi dividends of you can hold treasuries now. And I think that's I got to be honest. I mean, I think we might be showing our age a little bit because most people don't remember when rates were this high. I mean, I, I mean, I've been doing this 30 plus years now. And I remember when I was first in this, you know, I mean, it's, we had high treasury rates. We had high money market rates, you know, you used to get 5% on your cash in, in, uh, in a bank account even sometimes. So this is sort of new. And all of these strategies that have this cash component as opposed to a different underlying, it really has to sort of rewire people's thinking a lot because this just wasn't available for years in the markets. No, you're, you're right. It didn't, the, the using treasuries as a component of your portfolio didn't make a lot of sense when rates were at zero. I mean, yes, you got the stability depending on what you're doing with it, but if you're looking for growth on a bond that's paying you, you know, nothing. I'm not sure why you're owning it unless you needed the security, right? I mean, we, we don't have to go into why negative rates existed in Europe and why they kept buying bonds that would cost them eventually. But that's, that's besides the point. But I, I, I'm with you, Derek, that you could now more tactics open up to you uh, uh, now that you have, uh, you know, rates, uh, at rates where they are. I was just, as we were sitting here talking, I was like, I wonder if I looked at a fairly high, you know, dividend stock, uh, what the difference in the options market is. And I don't, I don't want to call out this particular ticker, but, uh, cause I don't, we don't like to make recommendations, but I'm sure I could think of, oh, I don't know, uh, a telecom company that's got a fairly, uh, uh, robust yield. And when, you know, so if in those scenarios, you may say, look, I still like owning the long stock because I'm going to get a seven, six, seven percent uh, uh, payout 
on just from the dividends, right? When you look at say the uh, you know in the money calls, com- sorry, the out of the money call calls compared to the in the money puts, believe it or not, ladies and gentlemen, the market doesn't give you anything for free. You actually can see the dividend reflected in those put options. So in other words, when you're selling the puts, you know, you're going to, the market knows it's coming, right? The market knows that that these uh, higher dividends are coming. You will get, some of that will be reflected in the premium of that in the money put. So I think it still behooves you to go and look at, you know, instead of owning the stock and selling a call, even when you have a high dividend stock, you should look at what the same strike is paying you uh, on the put side of the equation, because uh, the typically the market will reflect that in there, and now you can still do the same structure: sell the in the money put, buy the treasury, earn a little more now in time decay on that put, because part of the dividend is reflected in the price. It's a, another complicated concept, but if you're really thinking about making the switch from covered calls to in the money puts, then it's worth looking and then doing your math on that. At some point, Jay, we'll have to actually write the book together. We've been talking about writing for the last couple of years, if we ever get time. Maybe maybe next year. I don't know. (laughs) Who knows? We'll include a chapter on in the money puts versus covered calls. I think that would be wonderful. For sure. All right. Let's talk about uh, some things, some of our recommendations. Uh, Jay, we've been busy this week. I don't know. Do you have anything? I have one or two things. Uh, well, I think I, I told you that uh, uh, as as much as it may uh, be more for entertainment, I think I have to go see the Dumb Money oh, movie come on. this weekend. I think I got to go. Like I I love it when I can go watch something that I lived right to see the the see the Hollywood take on the on it. Uh, you, you made you made a noise there. What was that? I think this is. I, I don't. I, I'm afraid they're going to like sensationalize sensationalize some of this. Like. The the guy, the the deep value guy who who's like, oh, you put out all this research. Like he wasn't right. It's just more buyers than sellers caused GameStop to go up. <laughs> I'm sorry. The guy's research was wrong. They haven't made money. They haven't done any of the stuff he thought they could. So when everyone says to me, oh, no, no, that everyone was against this guy. He was right. And he was the only one. Who said, no, he wasn't right. The, 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 and I, I don't know what's going to happen with the company. I saw Ryan Cohen is now the... The CEO again, wasn't he the chewy guy? And he said, you know, I, I didn't even read it or anything. Uh, that's what I'm saying. Like, I don't know. I, I Listen, I'm going to go because, listen, it wasn't that long ago that we all just lived through that and we watched it. And one of our, you know, we did a podcast about short selling and short squeezes and what happens to the markets. And I think people liked it a lot. I think it's an interesting topic. I don't know. I like going to see things that I live through. I, I mean, there's a show, and this is actually going to my, be my real recommendation, that because of your reaction, I knew I'd have to have. Um, there's a show on HBO called The Newsroom, and it uh, it's it's no longer running any uh, anymore. But uh, it was a really great show with Jeff Daniels in it, and it talked about you know, uh, a newsroom and reporters, and they talked about real events that happened. I think the first episode talks about, and I don't want to ruin too much, the, uh, the, the, the BP accident in the Gulf. And, you know, to go to watch the newsroom show and to see the events that you live through, uh, I don't know, I always find that entertaining to say, yeah, this is based on real life stuff and real life stuff that I remember. I actually, we watched that show when it, when it was on, back when we had to wait for another week to see the episodes. Yeah, Jeff Daniels, um, Sam, was it Sam Waterston, the guy from Law & Order? Yep. He, he's in that too. Yep, he's in it. Um, yeah, I mean, there, there's a couple people. We like that. I remember that. That was it's very good. I've been seeing clips on it uh, uh, lately, and I'm like, I really need to go back and watch it. It's very good. Yeah, no, I, I agree. I thought it was good. All right, by the way, Dumb Money – Part of the reason why I laugh at dumb money is there was a, a book about day trading that was written called Dumb Money, Adventures of a Day Trader. Do you know when that was put out, Jay? No. September 14th, 2000. So Dumb Money, the movie, came out almost, you know, 23 years later. And I remember reading that book, and it was about the SOS bandits and about how, you know, you used to be able to try and exploit the SOS bandits. And it was, it was sort of a chronicle of this guy who, you know, and then it, he was doing well and it wasn't going well, not surprising. 
And I remember it was pretty entertaining. So I just looked it up on Amazon. It's still, it's still around. So anyway, All right. uh, I'm going to give a pre-recommendation because I am going to read this book. Zeke Fox, uh, Fox is spelled F-A-U-X, wrote a book called Number Go Up about the, the sort of whole fiasco with Sam Bankman Freed. And I think he was actually oh. embedded with, uh, with SBF. And I, I saw the first part of the book was, you know, I'd like to be able to see, say that I saw all the fraud and I'm the one who uncovered it. But just like all of you, I was sort of taken in by it. So it, it's supposed to be really good, really entertaining. I've heard him on some podcasts. And, uh, so, and, and he's a crypto skeptic. So we're aligned there for sure. Yeah, he's right up your alley on but that I've, one. That's I've great. heard it's pretty good. So, And then the only other thing, uh, somebody asked me, is I mentioned the Gulag, Gulag Archipelago. This is a tough book to read. It's about being in a Siberian uh, prison. Uh, but the author's name is Alexandra Solzutsin. Solzutskin. Um, I, I thought I had the pronunciation right, but I totally screwed up. The Gulag Archipelago, but... There's an abridged version that's like 500 pages. The original was like 1,800 pages. A little light reading for the weekend. Uh, it's a tough read. I read all 1,800 pages. It's, but it's just it's really descriptive about just uh, being in the prison and his show trial and all that stuff. But I, this became popular again. I wouldn't say popular. It was never really that popular. It sort of had a, a cult following. But in Billions, they named one of the episodes the Gulag Archipelago. So. There you go. Alexander Solzitskin. Maybe that's how you say it. All right. Well, Gulag uh, or not, Billion still on our recommendation list. I hope you're still watching. Of course. It. It's still going of on. Of course. This. I want to see yeah. if Axe. It, fe- it feels like it's yeah, coming Oh, we to can't say head. anything. Yeah. We can't say anything. All right, Jay, let's call it there. Yeah, that's all I said. Uh, we'll be back next week. Maybe we'll be back. Maybe we'll. No, we will. We will. With more. I'm going to actually get some recommendations for next week, some real ones. We'll be back. I'm not going to see Dumb Money, though. Great, Derek. I look forward to it. I refuse to see it. That and Barbie. (laughs) See everyone. All right.